who pays for NATO? And from what I can gather here, the, the argument seems to be, do individual country, countries pay for their own uh, military resources or uh, do they put it in a pool for NATO to share? Yeah, it's, it's generally paying for their own military resources, but actually it's be part of a team always carries a bit of a burden as well. Um, the real story here is that for many years, America, that spends over 4% of its GDP on NATO, yeah. provides a, and it's huge defence spending, provides an amazing umbrella of defence for NATO. But many of the other NATO countries pay significantly less, a quarter of what the Americans pay. And that's never been considered particularly fair, but in a world where nobody has really felt threatened that was felt to be reasonable. Well, now why that did everybody <coughs> feel threatened? What, what way will that change? Well, we're already seeing that uh, Germany, for example, is increasing its defence spending from 1.2% up to try and commit to the 2%. But it's not just about money. I know there's been a lot of conversation in the UK about increasing defence budgets. It's also how you spend that money. Defence assumptions, what sort of things this nation would want to get involved in, traditionally was not based on an existential threat like Russia. Um, now that Russia has invaded Ukraine and potentially has much greater ambitions beyond Ukraine, that's been a wake-up call for NATO and particularly about what our military structures should look like. Um, and I think particularly for me, the one big lesson is that no nation, apart from maybe America, can withstand a direct attack mm. by something as big as Russia. So you have to be part of a team. And NATO provides that team. Uh, it does, but a real-time wake-up call is always difficult, isn't it, when you're facing an existing threat. The threat is already there. And there are big questions, and there have been a lot of criticisms of NATO, indeed, for the way they've handled this particular problem with Putin. And are there growing questions about what that role will now take, given the shape of NATO is expanding with Sweden and Finland now being accepted in with Turkey's blessing? Yes, I mean, let's be clear, Ukraine is not a member of NATO and therefore NATO could not get involved directly as an organisation. That didn't stop member states supporting Ukraine, providing arms and weapons and stuff like that. But it's a much bigger step for NATO itself to get involved. The irony of this situation is that Putin felt threatened by the gradual expansion of NATO and yet the one thing that he has brought about by his actions is a willingness for Ukraine to join, and now Finland and Switzerland, uh, Sweden, sorry, now are looking to, to join, and it looks like Turkey's removed its block to that as well. So, um, gradually, the NATO umbrella is, is spreading, which is exactly what Putin didn't want to happen. Yeah, but it hasn't stopped the war, hasn't worked in what it was set out to achieve, has it? And, you know, the question is, lots of talk from military folk, this is the 1937 moment. Well, if that is the case, are we approaching this in the right way, do you think? Unfortunately, the answer to that question lies in Putin's head because none of us know what his ambitions are. If his ambitions are purely to seize the Donbass, the land bridge and Crimea and then stop, because now he's secured Sevastopol, the, the strategically important port, then the war will end probably by the year's end and a series of very difficult negotiations will ensue and then we've got to unwind our position with Russia. The trouble is Putin's narrative starts to talk more about Peter the Great, one of the architects of the former Soviet Union. He's starting to talk about the former Warsaw Pact countries being part of historic Russia. Mm. All of that language implies that he wants to re-establish re Russian greatness, mm. the Russian Empire. And if he wants to do that, then clearly Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania are up to the north, which are now under an, um, a NATO umbrella. That now directly involves NATO. Mm. And that's why... We mustn't, as a West, become complacent, and that's why the NATO has made the decision to increase its troops from 40,000 to 300,000 high readiness troops, just so it's ready and providing a credible deterrent against Putin's potential ambitions. Yeah. Uh, politicians at these times can be all huff and no puff, really, uh, with all of this. And we hear the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. He is saying, and you will know as an ex-service uh, person of uh, huge responsibility... He's saying that the armed forces are surviving on a diet of smoke and mirrors. And you see Boris Johnson, for all his talk, has refused to increase defence spending this year and therefore breaking a manifesto promise on this. I'd rather not get into dragging into politics. What I would say is that defence spending has been increasing. We are meeting our 2% budget. And again, it's a political decision. But I live in a country, I'm a taxpayer like you are, and um, we have the biggest national debt we've had in a lifetime. We've got NHS yeah. challenges, welfare challenges. Defence is a choice. It's a priority. 
And I think in the terms of our place in NATO, our place in the world order, what our, one of our priorities needs to be to encourage other countries to pay their way and then provide a beacon of leadership yes. to how that money gets spent. But you spent. can't lead if, as an Air Vice Marshal, you may not have had uh, the personnel or the equipment at your disposal that you wanted. I don't know if you did or didn't. Uh, what would you say uh, in your position when you were serving? Had you got what you wanted and needed? I don't think any organisation gets everything they want. But if you look at the scale of the, the funding, we put a lot of money into defence as a nation. And I think most military leaders always want more. The British Army will always want a bigger army. The Navy would want a bigger Navy. The Royal Air Force would want a greater number of assets. The challenge is everybody has to live within a financial envelope. And there are some difficult choices to make in there. One of them is to complain about the budget and asking just for yes. more money. Another is to actually make grown-up decisions to what you but get and how you make it most effective. You, you didn't feel you were running, as the Defence Secretary says, on a diet of smoke and mirrors. Absolutely not. I think the one thing that has changed, though, is that we were configuring... The number one priority for defence is defence of the realm, defence of our nation. Mm -hmm. And we've never really felt threatened. Yes, the Russians make probes or whatever. So we've been involved in wars of choice for the last 20, 30 years. What's fundamentally changed is Putin's actions now risk being an existential threat to our way of life in this country. That has changed defence assumptions, and therefore, should we reconfigure defence accordingly? Should we have more ways of exercising with our partners rather than being autonomous. So I do think there are... We could always spend more money, and there are people much better placed than I to judge where that money would be spent. Okay. I just am not entirely convinced that money is the answer. Yeah. OK. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.